could have loved you, girl, like a planet. Mark Bolan was an enigma within an enigma, a man who only existed to be a star. He did precisely what he said he would do and became a star. Mark probably wrote his own epitaph. He danced right out of the womb and into the tomb. Many have claimed to know the real Mark Bolan, but it's doubtful if Bolan himself had any idea of where his true identity lay. There was a real Mark Bolan, uh, but it was unreal. Here we tell the Mark Bolan story with new insight from his closest friends. It's the story of a man who was obsessed with being a star and dreamed of one day being an icon. Mark had always said he would never make it to 30. He always wanted to be Elvis Presley, James Dean or whatever. He kind of got his wish. He kind of got what he wanted. In 1971, Mark Bolan, a Tolkien elf, exploded onto the pop scene. She's my woman of gold, she's not very old, uh -huh. Strewing it with sequins and sparkling flash. She's my woman of gold, she's not very old, uh -huh. The androgynous elf with the rosewood mouth had become the lurex-clad glitter god pioneer of glam rock. Hit followed hit with the inevitability of night following day. Bolan shimmered and glittered. He wore velvet and gold lame, skin-tight satins, tap shoes, and silver stars under his eyes. For the first time since Beatlemania, and never again since, young girls swooned, fainted, and wept at the sight of Mark Bolan, the swaggering pop idol. The press dubbed it t rex to see. The minute he came on stage, it would be screaming like the Beatles in the early days, only more so. They were just passing out, throwing things. And the worst part was at the end of the gig was trying to get out of the venue. That became almost impossible. I was with Mark. I always travel with Mark. Mark was quite a bit shorter than me, and the girls were after locks of his hair. And so they, they come armed with scissors, pairs of scissors, and, and I was, we came out, and all of a sudden, at exactly my eye level, are all these scissors trying to get it, you know, and they were ripping clothes off, and uh, I thought I was gonna have my eyes out, actually, and we were then being pushed through into the car. It was exhilarating and scary both at the same time. And I was looking at Mark over there and he was wearing his sort of big boa feather thing and he was so loving it. I mean, this was what he'd been waiting for for God knows how many years. It was, you know, 12, 13, 14, 15 year old girls. And the other uh, indelicate, aspect of all of this is you go in, out into the auditorium after T-Rex had come off stage at the end of the concert and there was this overpowering smell of urine because so many of the girls had wet themselves in their excitement. I used to be a toilet cleaner and every job's got its perks and on Sunday I would, um, I would they'd give me a torch in the uniform and I'd show the uh, the fans to the seats for the rock concerts. Then T-Rex came along and it was just incredible because I mean part of my job was to stop the fans running down to the front of the stage. But of course there 2,000 screaming girls just trampled over me and like so I ended up at the front. I thought blimey here I am a toilet cleaner and he's got 2,000 screaming girls after him. So he had the job that I wanted. I went out the next day and bought a guitar. <laughs> It's 1 p.m. on Thursday, September the 15th, 1977, and Mark is meeting with Granada TV executive Muriel Young and TV producer Mike Mansfield. Both have been instrumental in the resurgence of Mark's career. Today's going to be a fantastic day. 
Muriel had news of a new TV series to follow up on Boland's ITV debut of earlier that year, aptly named Mark. Spectacular. I guess when you've been in the business as long as I have, then you can sort of see when there's a spark there and an appeal and a charisma, as we've seen in the last series. What, what was your take? Mike Mansfield had asked Mark to collaborate on a brand new musical concept, a pop opera. For Mark Bolan, four years of superstardom had been followed by three years in the pop doldrums, including a destructive relationship with champagne and cocaine and a ballooning weight problem. And I'm, I'm healthy, I'm slim and I'm ready to rock. Now Mark Bolan was on his way back. And to compound his happiness on this day, his longtime lover, Gloria Jones, was flying into London after several weeks away recording in Los Angeles. I'm really happy. Gloria's back in the country. I've had a successful TV show. It's going to be my year this year. From childhood, Mark Feld, as he was christened, always believed that he would be famous. He said, I was always a star, even if it meant being a star of just three streets in Hackney. He was like that local star. He had charisma, we all down Stanford Hill to the Stipp House, or down around Clapton Common, or, or, or up in Manor House, or just down by the bus stop. Mark came out posing. He was born a star, you have to see that. When you saw him, you couldn't take your eyes off him. That monster charisma, wonderful, wonderful. He was always saying, I'm going to be famous. And, uh, and, and looking back on it, he was destined to be famous. He had come to school in brightly coloured aluminous socks and jeans and stuff like that, even at that early age, you know, 10. He used to have a guitar in them early days. He'd stand in the corner of the playground strumming the guitar. He really had a disturbing sense of self-belief in his own destiny. I mean, it really was actually quite frightening. I mean, he always said, I am going to be a star. And apparently when he was at school, he used to pretty much get into trouble for the same thing because he saw no point in real formal education because he believed quite firmly that he was going to be a superstar. As a 14-year-old model obsessed with style, Mark swaggered around Soho with his fellow mod, Jeff Dexter. The best thing would be to have a few very sharp suits and a very well collared shirt and all your accessories had to match and fit in. The whole idea was to look as smart as you possibly could. His star was tremendous. He looked like, when he was 14, he looked like a, a, you know, the charisma was oozing, monster oozing out of him. He was always a star. The attitude was to be cool, I think. I don't know if we really were cool, because we were both midgets. I suppose we were both really quite amusing thinking about it now. But we thought we were cool. We. Uh, we were both small, we probably felt we were bigger than Morwas. We had more front than Morwas. The teenage Mark Boland started to hang out at the in music venues, telling everyone who would listen he was heading for the big time. He used to come up to the um, pub above Leicester Square tube station called the Brewmaster, where a lot of us music hacks used to hang out. And he would come in there and sell himself. You know, I'm going to be bigger than Elvis, and I'm going to be bigger than anybody, bigger than Cliff, bigger than the Beatles, you know, and, and we'd all go, yes, 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 you know. Sit down, Mark, there's a good boy, and when you're old enough to buy a drink, come back again. Nobody was really kind of like rude to him, but we were a little patronising. I mean, we were, you know, we were drinking with people like The Who and uh, um, The Holliers and uh, major sort of bands of that time up in the bar, and there was this little chap coming in telling us all he was going to be, you know, bigger than all of them. <laughs> Please, you know. <laughs> so, I mean, we were hardly encouraging, I suppose. Mark first dipped his toe in the water of the music business with a short-lived band called John's Children. <laughs> John's Children were all about being outrageous and they all wore white suits on stage and, uh, and they had... Uh, gold chains around their necks and they, and they whipped each other with silver whips. Lots of flagellation scenes. <laughs> and they, uh, they wrote some outrageously strange songs like Thomas A. Beckett, which was all about murder, and um, Desdemona. Um, and that Mark wrote them a little song called Testimony, I think it was called, which he always said was the filthiest song he ever wrote. <laughs> he was quite proud of that fact. And the BBC banned it. And shortly afterwards, I think he thought it was time to leave John's children. 
And at that time, in the early 60s, the biggest thing on the scene was Bob Dylan. And the hippie movement, the peace and love thing, was beginning to gain force. In the jingle jangle morning, I'll come following you. The key mantra elements were peace and love. The, the, this was the generation that now is going to change the world, sexually, politically, financially. The music was very important part of the development of this concept of, uh, you know, everything's great, you love your fellow man. Uh, right in the middle of um, uh, the summer of love, the Beatles brought out All You Need Is Love. Everybody was taking drugs, wearing very, very colorful clothes, growing their hair. Mark tuned into it very quickly. He was very quick at picking up vibrations and um, feelings of the time, the winds of change, he sniffed very quickly. And consequently, um, he put together this band, which originally was five people, Tyrannosaurus Rex. And then either for economic reasons or simply because the band didn't work, they whittled it down to two. Just he and Steve Peregrine took. Mark transformed from quite a sort of, you know, angular sort of mod image in 64, 65 to this much more loose and rounded 1967 London boy. Kind of like everybody did, just literally grow your hair, put on nice loose colourful clothes and sit cross-legged on a carpet playing acoustic guitar. My friends and I had uh, spent many an hour sitting cross-legged, uh, the, the, the Greyhound Croydon, where Tyrannosaurus Rex would play. And you know, this fey, elfin, curly headed Mark singing um, Desdemona and uh, or Debada, you know. <laughs> Mark really picked up on the sound of words or the intuitive grasp of, of something rather than really what it actually meant. And I'm not sure that Mark knew what sense they made, but he liked the sound of the words. And he produced things like, my people were fair and had sky in their hair, but now they're content to wear stars on their brows and beard of stars and unicorn. He loved kind of like slightly mystical, magical kind of things like that. It was very Tolkien-ish. I mean, he was into Lord of the Rings. Mark loved these kind of cult books of the period. And he was into Michael Moorcock and um, Cahill Gibran. Doors of Perception, Aldous Huxley he read because they heard the Beatles had read it and things like that. He had such an imagination. I mean, pixies, elves, and dwarves, and stuff, you know. All very uh, effete and um, esoteric. Come the sound, see it run across the sky. See it cry for you and no one else. The finest work he ever did, in my opinion, was, to, to illustrate that point, was A Beard of Stars, the last album that carried the Tyrannosaurus Rex moniker which ends with him thumping out an eight or nine minute Les Paul romp through uh, Elemental Child. You hear that, you, you see the, uh, this rock star in embryo. I took to him immediately. Mark believed Tyrannosaurus Rex to be the last outpost of hippiedom. He presided over reverential gatherings of the flower children who refused to wilt. When Mark was not performing, nights were spent at his flat where poems and songs were flowing as liberally as the jasmine tea and the vegetarian food. Every day was a fantastic day. Very few things, the only things that got in our way were being busted by the police for having a bit of dope or something, that was the only thing that ever got in our way. But the rest of the time we spent being very happy, we laughed a lot, and we had great times. It was now that the disc jockey John Peel, who became a close friend, began to have a huge influence on Mark's career. 
John was on the radio and when and when uh, they closed down the Pirates, John moved into Radio One. John put Mark in front of everything he ever did, right up to the time his first records were properly made. The Mark Boland-John Peel friendship was doomed, as we shall see, when Mark Boland displayed a ruthless streak that became more and more apparent as his career took off. Well, I think Mark had a sense of self-preservation. And if there was something that he saw that he was going to have to do in order to um, continue his march upwards towards that destiny of being a star, people would get dumped along the way, and people did get dumped along the way. It's 4 p.m. on Thursday, September the 15th, 1977. Mark goes to visit his dentist. He's still very up about life, his life in particular. Hi. Hi. Good to see you again. Is he here? He is. He is. Hang on, I'll show you through. Hi. But Mark was drinking that day, and though not to excess, it was a little disturbing for his friends. They knew how hard he had worked to get off the booze. If it's only going to be 10 minutes, I'm eating glow later on. What about a drink? I brought a bottle of wine with me. The glass of wine Mark shared with his dentist that day would by no means be his last. Tragedy loomed as Mark's old demons reared their dangerous head again. Cheers, cheers, cheers. Nice to see you again. By 1971, rock music was changing. The more robust sound of Led Zeppelin, Jethro Tull, Humble Pie and Credence Clearwater Revival was dominating the market. High energy blues rock. And then came Mungo Jerry with the big hit In the Summertime, broadening the appeal of a falsetto voice. Put the two together, and out came Mark Bolan. We'd been talking about poetry and what rocks, rock and roll writers there were that really meant something, and. I remember we had this conversation about Chuck Berry being super pop poet. Really rockin' and rollin'. Pittsburgh, PA. Deep in the heart of Texas. Around the Frisco Bay. And how simple he made the words with the rhythm. And what Mark was doing with Tyrannosaurus Rex was a little bit more complicated. Sweet little Texas. The idea was that he would simplify the rhythm, made it straight on the four on the floor and simple, and that was the creation of Rider White Swan. That was the first breakthrough to become the new T-Rex, as opposed to Tyrannosaurus Rex. Mark Bolan was about to be transformed from a hippie troubadour to a swaggering pop idol. Tired of his rug and his joss sticks, Mark Bolan plugged in his guitar and reached for the cocaine. She ain't no rich and I love the way she twitch, uh -huh. Now Bolan was treated like a king wherever he went, and he was bombarded with images of himself from magazines, billboards, television, and T-shirts. Now Mark Bolan cared for nothing but the fact that he was Mark Bolan, a boy from nowhere whose genius had been recognized around the world, and that he could do exactly what he pleased. Success had transformed Mark Bolan into a man whose Faustian quest for fame would rob him of his dignity. 
Bolin had been prepared to sacrifice everything for fame, even an old friend. At the time, John Peel and Mark had had, had a breaking of the waves at the release of, of Get It On, because um, John was then at that point writing for Disco Music Echo, I think it was, and had reviewed each of Mark's singles and had get. Got, uh, been getting sort of progressively less enthusiastic about them as Mark just became more and more commercial and I think John felt was beginning to kind of sell out and lose his musical integrity and all of this stuff so when Get It On came and this is now the full scale sort of pop rock record John's patience just sort of ran out and he just blasted this single and Mark, it was two things. Mark was absolutely angry, but he was also very, very upset that uh, he just felt let down by his friend that he could be so critical of, of something that Mark himself felt was the best thing he'd ever done. And that was it. They just, that was it. That just thump like that, and they stopped, just stopped talking at that moment. But as one friend was left at the wayside, many others clambered on board the Bolin bandwagon. You know, me, I'm liking these records more and more each one that comes out. Um, Get It On was the peak for me, but I think also Telegram Sam. It's a fantastic record. Metal Guru was the first one that I had reservations about. Um, and I, I still don't think it's one of the best T-Rex singles. Subsequently then, of course, we did get another run. And, and in fact, you look back now on the T-Rex catalogue and uh, I Love to Boogie and, and uh, Children of the Revolution and stuff like that has seriously t stood the test of time. She ain't no rich and I love the way she twitch, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. By now, Mark had spawned many imitations as glam rock dominated the charts. Gary Glitter, Rod Stewart, Slade, The Sweet, and most significantly, David Bowie, who would feature prominently in Mark's last few weeks in the public eye. David was a very clever boy. He was very good at what he did. Mark was feeling unsure at certain times, but although he would never show it, the rivalry when they were together, you could see them sort of pushing their shoulders forward like old mods would have done in a ballroom or a nightclub just to be up front. In 1969, David Bowie toured with T-Rex as the opening act. Those two were like, a bit like Rod and Elton. They were the best of friends, but, you know, bantered. Mm. Mark would wind Bowie up a lot. He, um, yeah. I don't suppose he meant it for one second. David has never denied it, but Mark used to tell this wonderful story of the two of them being on the King's Road, having come out from lunch, and they were both world-famous stars, and standing, and a coach pulled up full of schoolgirls. <laughs> who all banged on the window and screamed at Mark and didn't know Bowie. And it wouldn't surprise me one bit, because the thing about Mark, you know, you learn if you don't want to be recognised, if you don't want to be approached in the street, if you don't want to be approached at airports or railway stations where you might be in public, you, you, you learn how to dress down, you learn how to hide and just drop your chin as you walk. There's all kinds of tricks so that you, to, to prevent being noticed. Mark wouldn't want to be missed. Mark would have the hair, the, 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 the satin scarf all around and a feather boa and high heels in the street. You know, all of the time he was on. Mark was like Sammy Davis Jr. You know, open the fridge, they do 20 minutes. Mark Bolan was now the officially recognized number one pop star in the UK and he aimed to keep himself in the spotlight. He was the most self publicised sort of individual consciously that I ever met, and sometimes the most self-deluded. But he, he, he could make something out of nothing the whole time, and he loved the spotlight, he loved being in the spotlight. Well, he was, he was a showman, you know, he was, he was Bruce Forsyth in a strange way. He was an entertainer, he gave them what they wanted. He was a great interview whenever he was interviewed by any of the press, even though they knew he was talking crap, he could still spin out such a story, they would write every single word of it down, and, and they loved it. He definitely, he was definitely good value. 
he was a publicist's dream actually to look after because he was always prepared to say whatever the journalist wanted to hear. You know, what should we do today, Keith? You know, I, I know, tell them I've got a gold bear that I take on tour with me. They love that one. Um, uh, we've done bisexual, what about trisexual? I never did understand what he meant by that. <laughs> Being and living the life of a star was all Mark knew. Real life was a stranger to him. He was cack-handed. He was hopeless at, uh, you know, he, he had no um, hand coordination at all, for instance. You know, where I came from, they say he was girly, you know? The sports boys, the boys from the football pitch and the rugger, the rugger team would call him girly. He played guitar for me at Abbey Road on one of my last EMI albums, and they had a table tennis up in the green room at, um, where was it, Air London. There was a table tennis table. Now, I'm quite good at that. Yeah, I come from a family of uh, sporting types, very coordinated men and women, and uh, oh boy, you know, you're talking about a man who couldn't, you know, <laughs> he couldn't play table tennis, let's put it that way, he wasn't a man's man in that sense, okay? But Gloria will tell you, they went to Monte Carlo and spent all their money, she had a great story about them being in you know, like the five-star flash hotel in Monte Carlo. Mark would buy all the kit. You know, he would buy the very top-of-the-range whites for tennis. And, uh, you know, the right shorts, the right top, and all the right shoes and socks, the right rackets. He would have spent on nothing but the very best in case anyone came past and recognised him. He would have to have the very best. It would have been certainly very seriously on his mind when he was purchasing these things and she told me how they bought absolutely everything for a, 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 a lot of money and then get onto the tennis court and of course he can't hit the ball he can't throw it in the air and whack it <laughs> but he had to pose he had to have the kit he had to look like he knew what he was doing he had to look like that's what you do in monte carlo you got this five-star hotel with the tennis courts out there go and use them but buy the kit first you know why not just go out mark you know put on a pair of plimp soles or trainers and just see if you can do it what he really loved was being in that spotlight was being famous he loved that more than anything to be famous was what he loved. And if he could be with famous people who were more famous than he was, even better. I was looking after the Rolling Stones at the time and, and I'd got him a, a backstage pass to come and see us. And uh, <laughs> shortly before the Stones were due to go on stage and he insisted on going into Jagger's dressing room and saying hello. And I said, I don't think now's the time, Mark, because he's a bit stressed out. You know, when you come back after the show, no, I'm not sure I'm gonna be able to stay all the way through. I'll go in now. And he was a bit, out of it as well. Well, anyway, he, he waltzed into the dressing room, shut the door behind him, and there was this scream from inside, and, and, and this muffled voice saying, he's grabbed my balls! <laughs> and the next thing that happened was two security guys rushed in, carrying Mark out, sort of one under each arm with his feet sort of kicking in the air <laughs> and him sort of like saying I didn't realize they were sacrosanct I didn't realize they were sacrosanct and every time he came up to my office after that he always asked how golden balls was <laughs> but Mark Bolan was changing well his character changed because of the mad success everything was written about him that he was some new superstar and he believed it. He believed that he could do no wrong. Basically, he, he suddenly believed that whatever he did was so good that he didn't have to think or work at it. He just thought it fell out of him. And it made him very difficult for lots of people. And uh, at the same time, lots of people fell by the wayside because he was suddenly, suddenly a superstar. By now, Mark has moved on to become a, a different person from the person that John and I knew in 1967. And it was interesting too to watch him because his weight ballooned um, at this period of time. And it seemed to me that, that this was symbolic of, of his ego getting bigger and bigger. So he was sort of ballooning with the size of his ego. And he did get into big ego problems as we all know and, and became extremely difficult. 
the sort of slightly boastful, but but in a joking way. Yeah, no, we've sold millions of records. Don't you know? Then became it was serious. Yeah, we sold millions of records. You know, and the emphasis became so completely different. And 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 then that was it. And, uh, and I saw very very little of of Mark from then on. A part of the reason for what I saw as a decline was his excesses. He did start drinking too much. Then there was a period when he was going out with Harry Nilsson and Ringo and Keith Moon. <laughs> well, I mean, that combination more or less speaks for itself, doesn't it? I mean, I think there's only one left alive, isn't there? Um, and there was a bit of cocaine going down, I think, as well. It became mad as the drink crept in and the drugs crept in. People do turn into monsters, and Mark turned into Elvis Presley on acid. And it, well, it wasn't acid, it was alcohol and cocaine. That didn't help him at all. He knew how to open a bottle of champagne, although what we, we really drank together was terribly, terribly smashed all the time it was cognac. I gave that up, but I mean, we did a lot of, uh, a lot of bad, uh, we spent our money in a lot of uh, the wrong ways. I don't know if it was drugs or it was pills or it was food. He was out of drink, but he was, you know, maybe three, four stone, five stone overweight. Monster, monster, monster fat. And this is what I was saying about symbolism, the symbolic thing of him, his weight filling out and everything, because he was getting bigger and bigger. There's, there's no doubt about that. But I think that he just got swept up with this whole thing of how big I am. And uh, eventually, you know, it's, you're going... Uh, hello, um, I, I'm here, and, and that's, that's a bit what it was like. He was a beautiful looking boy, he had great friends around him, he had great management, and he had some fantastic music, but it all turned into pop trash, I'm afraid. As his fame declined and his records stayed on the shelves, Boland's capacity for self-publicity had turned into a cruel self-delusion. The thing about Mark again was his sort of like ability for self-deception, you know. I mean, he really could bring himself to believe in his own publicity. I think in a way some of that shut him in on himself and, and he, he began to actually kind of like believe these things were, were true. There was one occasion where my partner, uh, Chris Williams, was going down to um, see him and had rung up to make arrangements to meet him at his house off the King's Road and he said oh Chris he said, you've got to be careful if you're coming this morning there are thousands of fans around the house you know they nearly tore me apart when I came in and this was one of the p periods in time when he was going through a bit of a lull anyway and um, Chris said oh, well what do you want me to do he said well when you get down here phone me from the telephone box across the road there's a red telephone box just across the road in the King's Road and I'll open the front door and you make a run for it from the other side of the road. So Chris dutifully did as he was told. <laughs> there wasn't a soul there. And so he burst puffing and perspiring through his front door. I said, well, well, you know, where are they? He said, oh, they're all hiding behind that wall over there. You know, oh, well, I mean, they weren't. When it's there, you boy? <laughs> Mark never believed he could lose his popularity. He always thought he was still the same teenage idol he was when t rex was at its height. He still believed there were people camping outside his house or the flat waiting for him every minute of the day when the whole thing had already burst and moved on. He believed that he was being followed everywhere. He still thought the fans, there were always the fans. The fans are, some fans are incredibly loyal and they'll live with anything, but the majority of them had gone. Mark's magic had actually gone. As Bolan got fat, Bowie got thin. Bolan couldn't get a hit, Bowie took America. As the hits dried up, Bolan failed to dry out. To him, now everything he did was a stroke of genius. And surrounded by an entourage that agreed with him and fueled by booze and coke, he was not dissuaded, even though the following day he would not be able to remember what he recorded the night before. Oh, 
8 p.m. Thursday, 15th of September, 1977, and Jeff Dexter is checking out a new punk band at the Speakeasy Club in central London, where he was expecting to meet up with Mark, Gloria, and her brother Richard Jones. The plan had been to go to Morton's restaurant and meet up with Mark's manager, Tony Howard, and some friends. But then Mark sat down with the punk band to give them, first of all, the benefit of his company, and later, business advice. The money will come. The money will come. Do you remember get it on? Get it on. Get it on. And Mark said, well, I'm going to Morton's and I've got to eat something. So I phoned ahead to Morton's and I told Tony, Mark's on his way now, be careful. And I'm afraid I didn't go to Morton's. I, I didn't want to be in that situation. And that's the last I saw of Mark until well, that's the last I saw of Mark. By early 1976, Mark Bolan had been out of the spotlight he craved for three years. In the meantime, pop music had become stagnant. A world of glam imposters, self-indulgent progressive rockers and the insidious disco beat. And then along came the Sex Pistols with the singer Johnny Rotten, whose sneering face would symbolise the punk era, just as Bolin had symbolised glam rock. Ever the chameleon, Bolin latched onto punk rock with a mixture of instinct and opportunism. And while the punk sneered and spat at the rock hierarchy, they took Bolin to their hearts. It was a mutual appreciation society as Mark hailed the new wave as the children of the revolution. I took him to the Roxy Club, took him out to meet all those, and he had such a great time. He, he went for it after that in such a big way. And then a couple of the punks were interviewed and mentioned that they'd cut their teeth listening to T-Rex records. So suddenly he had, he had new support and he could, he could see a new way of inventing himself. Well, most of the people who ended up in punk groups in 77 um, were buying records, you know, in 71, 72, when T-Rex were at their peak, you know. So we, we all knew the stuff really well, and, uh, and it was really classy kind of pop. When you buy your first guitar and that, you can, you can pick out of Hot Love's well, it's free chords, you know, it's easy, it's a good little riff. Bolan's stuff was, uh, it, it was just fresh and exciting and he could really play a guitar as well. Hell of a guitar player. In 1977, Mark Boland toured the UK and took with him The Damned, one of the more memorable punk acts. I borrowed a shirt, uh, a T-Rex shirt, off of Mark Perry, who was uh, writing a uh, punk fanzine called Sniffing Glue. And um, there was a picture of me in Sounds wearing it. And uh, I suppose my, Mark must have seen it and gone, um, OK, they're the boys I want. Get them as my support act, you know? <laughs> Usually, you know, you have to travel in a little, you know, a transit van and you stay in a dodgy B&B and, uh, and everything's kind of, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a tough life, to be quite honest, but, um, but Mark paid for everything. Uh, we travelled on his coach, um, you know, if we, we had the same, same dinners as him and uh, he was, you know, used his PA and fantastic to us he, he was he was really decent and uh, he used to give us little bits of advice on the on the tour bus we opened and um, 
funnily enough, his, a lot of his fans liked us, you know, and, and a lot of our fans liked them. So the thing really worked much better than any of us thought, thought it would. Mm. Um, and it, you know, it was nice to play in front of like, you know, a bunch of, uh, you know, uh, attractive girls and stuff and we, we of course you know it was my my first proper tour so um, we, we took full advantage of it and chatted up as many of, them, of, of Mark's fans as possible you know which which pissed him off a little bit because sometimes we take them on the tour bus you know and we uh, we thought well you know we have a snog snog up the back of the bus and everything and as soon as they got on the bus you know they ran for Mark and <laughs> and left us behind you know which is uh, so, they, so they didn't want to kind of discuss you know punk rocker after all they wanted Mark there you go Mark's welcome to punk rock also signalled a massive change in his health and appearance. He cleaned up completely. He just, you know, wandered around with a tracksuit on and uh, while the rest of us were in the services, you know, eating uh, uh, greasy fry-ups and that, when Mark would be jogging around, you'd see him like, so you, you could time him by your watch. Hey, there goes Mark, yeah, it'd be another five seconds and he was desperately trying to get fit, you know, and he was, he was doing it. He was off the drink and drugs and he was, yeah, he was looking good. He had a big weight problem, you know. He was like the shape of a football at one point, um, which he shook off. I think he knew about it, and he shrugged it. He, he shook off a lot of the weight, you know, towards the end of his life. He would have known, you, you know, he wasn't stupid. He'd look in the mirror and think, you know, the screaming hordes are, are growing up, and if I'm going to win them back, I'm no longer going to be a poster on the bedroom wall. I have to be making serious music. I just felt that the, the original Mark Burnham was beginning to come back, and particularly with the onset of punk and the way that Mark really got into the whole new wave scene, and also the way that, that he was regarded as something of a hero figure by the emerging you know, punk generation. I think Mark, it, 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 Mark was beginning to stabilise again now and beginning to re return to the person that he was when I first met him. Sometimes I wonder what I'm about to do But there ain't no cure for the summertime There was no such second coming in Mark's mind. He hadn't gone away. He'd just re-trimmed himself and Things were going to be different. It had a new band, a red hot band, great band. Things were actually looking better for him. The favourable notices Mark coveted began to roll in. He sensed real success again, and that hunger replaced his hitherto unquenchable desire for alcohol and fatty food. And Boland's dedication was soon rewarded by Granada TV. He was invited to front a six-part pop show to go out late in the afternoon. With a nod towards punk rock, Mark invited the Jam, Boontown Rats, the Rods and Generation X onto the show, describing Generation X's singer, Billy Idol, as almost as pretty as me. Billy Idol is supposed to be as pretty as me. The final episode was broadcast in the summer of 1977. Thank you for goodbye and all the boys in the band, David, everybody. Well, the cats, you know they are. This is a new song. And it featured the great Mark Boland, David Bowie rivalry for what would become the final time. Oh, God, yeah, the, the, the Mark Boland, David Bowie confrontation on the, on the final TV show that Muriel Young um, directed was, was absolute chaos. That day at the studio was one of the worst experiences of our life. Bowie's people made a huge production about keeping people around, uh, away from him. I'd brought down a huge contingent of press, <laughs> ostensibly to see Mark, but also on the basis, of course, that David Bowie was going to be performing, and we wanted press for the show. We get back to the studio, we go to walk straight into the room I've been in every three days, I've been in three days a week for six weeks, and this guy puts his hand up and says, sorry, you can't go in there, it's closed session. I said, excuse me, who are you? He said, I'm stopping anyone going to see David Bay. I said, well, you get out the bloody way right now or you're out of here, mate. I walk straight past him into the studio. I walk in and there's this air and the studio is empty apart from Mark and the band and David. And there's two other people on the other door. So I go out the side door, I go to look for Muriel and I walk down the end of the hole. There's this floor manager standing on his side with his, with his kit on 
and there's a group of people, they're going to call out everyone out. They've been ordered out of their own studio by David Bowie's security. So they're calling a meeting, shop stewards come down, they're going to close the show. Then the run through itself was chaotic because people were arriving late. The Generation X turned up without their equipment and had to borrow from everybody else. And Mark was saying, if they smash anything of mine, I'll kill them. So this turned into an incredible row between everybody. Once Mark had twigged what had happened, the rivalry then really showed. Mark was going into his Cecil B. DeMille routine. You know, why do I have to do it all? You know, I can't be the director, the producer, the artist, and you know. And <laughs> it was very funny, actually. I loved it. It was live. It was going out live, but there was this incredible tension in the air. Anyway, Mark has, had given David one of his guitars, sort of peace offering. OK, we'll just go and do it, have a good time. And it was a good show. Because the show was overrunning, because David and Mark decided to do a jam at the end of it, in, on, in, during which Mark fell off the stage, much to David Bowie's amusement. You see the end of the show finishes just there with Mark falling off the stage. It, it was a sort of sign of things to come, I think, in a strange way. It was a kind of omen. The day of the accident, uh, Mark was, uh, was doing an interview for the BBC. And he ended up telling his life story. How he started in the business and and actually just told his whole life story. So he was like really up. And uh, so he suggested that we, we stop and have something to eat. Now we go into the restaurant. There are friends there. One gentleman he'd known since they were kids. And uh, Mark said, sing me a song. I said, are you serious? He said, yeah. So I got up and I did a number for him. And it was just a beautiful, beautiful evening. Not knowing that that would be our last evening together. And we were going home. And... Um, Fate, fate wasn't on our side. Everyone left the restaurant around four in the morning. Victoria accepted Richard's offer to drive her back to Mark and Gloria's home. That night, Mark had given the driver time off, so they drove home in Gloria Jones's Mini, with Richard and Victoria following them. The journey to Upper Richmond Road would usually take around an hour at that time of night. Gloria drove home through the streets of South London. went over a small humpback bridge, and that is all Gloria remembers. <laughs> Gloria's mini ploughed into a tree, killing Mark instantly and robbing him of a second taste of fame and fortune. The way the car was totaled, I should have died with him. In fact, uh, doctors, they felt, you know, how did, how, did I, how did I live? I wasn't told that uh, Mark had died. 
Richard uh, asked the doctors and nurses not to let me know. So I I didn't get to go to the service. I, I, I wasn't aware of anything. And uh, Tony came to the hospital, and he and Richard, and then they told me that I had lost Mark. It's fantastic when you meet your heroes and they turn out to be good people. And some of my heroes have turned out to be arseholes and some have been like sort of wonderful human beings. Mark was a great, great, great bloke. He was a very generous person, very generous of spirit, and that's what I would have cared about. I loved him. I loved listening to him. I knew he'd been through something that was an extremely rare occurrence. He'd been through something that very few of us would ever, ever experience, you know. It was Beatlemania for Bolan, wasn't it? The friend w that I mixed with was the fellow who sat cross-legged singing great poetry, very strange poetry. This was the fellow I sat with. I didn't, didn't sit and talk and, you know, a mix with um, the feather boa wearing, posing, pouting pop star. You don't uh, forget someone like Mark. And uh, yeah, I was very proud to have been his pal. Yeah. I could have loved you, girl, like a planet. I could have placed your love in the sky. Mark Bolan, whose song celebrated the movement of swans and seagulls, jeepsters and Cadillacs, was still at last. Mark had always said he would never make it to 30. Weird things about Mark, he could sometimes come up with little kind of almost clairvoyant things about you know, his own destiny and stuff. And he always said he would, he would die young, you know. I turned 30 the year before and Mark was about to become 32, which was to him a huge step. And he didn't quite make it. He loved these figures that died young and made a good corpse. Uh, James Dean, Marilyn Monroe, Montgomery Clift, you know, he adored those kind of iconic Hollywood figures. He always wanted to be Elvis Presley, James Dean or whatever. He kind of got his wish. He kind of got what he wanted. Now one sees the value of what Mark was doing in, in the early 70s, how good those records were and how much his influence still resonates. Look at the number of ads that use one or other of Mark's songs. And even the fact that Robbie Williams, on top of the Pops a year or so ago, was wearing a T-Rex slider T-shirt. Mark always said how great he was. <laughs> he always did. I know that he would be able to say, you see, look, I told you so. Life's a game.